Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, Great Weight Debate Equine, which is the second special interest webinar that the National Equine Forum is running. Uh, this precedes the 29th National Equine Forum, which is going to be held, I'm afraid, virtually on Thursday, the 4th of March. Um, I'm delighted that we've got over 200 people uh, on this webinar from all over the world. So a warm welcome to all of you, and I hope you enjoy uh, these discussions. Please note this webinar is being uh, recorded. Now, we couldn't do this without support. Uh, so a huge thanks uh, to our sponsors, uh, the British Horse Society, Red, Gwyn, Red Wings Horse Sanctuary, uh, Spillers, Talk Equine with the Horse Trust and World Horse Welfare. Links to weight management resources from our sponsors will appear in the chat periodically during the evening. I'd also like to thank our corporate friends for their kind support, the Jeffers Scholarship Trust, and also to thank friends for their support, uh, Central Prefix Register, Sue Dyson, New Shul, uh, and James Rayner. Um, a few housekeeping issues. Some of you may have been on uh, the Breeds webinar that we held uh, a, a week, about 10 days ago, uh, on just in time using science to save our breeds. The webinar replay will be live until just before midnight on Monday, the 1st of February. So if you do want to have a look at it, uh, please use the link posted in the chat. Uh, tickets are five pounds per person for the replay. As I've mentioned earlier, uh, useful links will be posted in the chat box as we go through the live webinar. And please put questions in the Q&A box. Tonight's program uh, is, on, uh, is on the resources page on the website, uh, and you'll see the link in the chat and the speaker biogs are on the webinar page on the website. Finally, we will circulate a link to tonight's recording in the next 48 hours. So please look out for an Eventbrite email letting you know how to register for the replay. That will be accessible for two weeks and going live until just before midnight on Monday the 15th of February. So that's all, if you like, the housekeeping stuff. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to uh, your chairman for this great weight debate webinar, Professor Pat Harris. Pat, over to you. I would like to add my welcome to this, the first great weight debate to be hosted by the National Equine Forum. I am delighted to have the opportunity to chair this discussion. Firstly, from a professional perspective, having spent much of the last two decades involved in studies trying to improve our understanding of why horses, ponies and donkeys become obese and how best to manage them. But perhaps even more importantly, from a personal perspective, as like many of you trying to manage an obese animal, I really appreciate that especially for some individuals, it can be very difficult to get them to lose weight. I wanted to start by explaining what we will and will not be discussing today. Although we appreciate that low body condition is also an important issue, we will be concentrating in this discussion on obesity and how we can help all of us trying to manage our obese animal. The debate also will not discuss in any detail the effect of appropriate rider weight to the horse, although again we appreciate that this is an important topic as is correct saddle and bridle fit. However, I'm sure that we will have plenty to discuss on the very important topic of obesity and weight management. So do we really have an obesity problem in our equines? Simply the answer is yes. Although seeing an obese animal is not new, the number of obese animals appear to be, appears to be increasing and it is becoming a globally recognized welfare issue. Rates of obesity may be around 30% or more in our UK equine population and may be as high as 70% in native pony breeds. 
Although more common in the leisure pleasure arena, obesity is still common even in those used for competition. So what do we mean by obesity and how can it be determined? Obesity can be defined as the excessive accumulation of body fat to the extent where it has a negative impact on health. In equines, it is associated perhaps most importantly with an increased risk of laminitis as well as some specific forms of colic. In addition, the increased mass and volume of fat can negatively affect reproductive and athletic performance as well as place increased stress on bones and joints. We typically use body condition scoring systems that estimate the presence or absence of fat at various points over the body. There are various body condition scoring systems in use, but most typically they involve the use of a 0 to 5 or a 1 to 9 scale. The 1 to 9 system, for example, offers descriptors for six key body areas which are independently scored through actual physical palpation, where one is equivalent to emaciated and nine means very obese, in order to accommodate individual differences in regional fat deposition. The average of these regional scores is then used to provide an overall body condition score value. More details of the two systems are given on the National Equine Forum's website. For animals in overweight to obese states, most of the bony prominences and landmarks have already been obscured by fat, making clear distinctions between the higher body condition scoring points difficult. And so currently obesity is defined as an animal having a body condition score of seven or more out of nine or greater than three out of three out of five. Because of this potential confusion, we have asked the panellists to clarify which system they are using whenever they refer to body condition score. So having set the scene, I am really looking forward to this opportunity to listen to the panellists and gain their insights into the challenges and opportunities they see for helping us with this very important issue. The first part of the programme will enable each of our panellists to outline their top two or three challenges and what they see as possible solutions. There will be a short discussion period after each set of three speakers and then we will have a general panel discussion. We are now going to hear from Lucy, Helen and Beth who will represent the equine vet, horse owner and livery yard owners perspectives. We will then have a short discussion after these presentations. Hi, I'm Lucy Grieve, an equine vet in Newmarket, and I deal with horses, ponies, donkeys from all walks of life, from rescue cases all the way up to elite racehorses. So I genuinely see the full spectrum of body conditions every day, whilst attending for everything from routine healthcare to emergencies. I see patterns when it comes to equine obesity, and I've lived through some tough lessons during my career, which I'll try and share with you now. The first thing that strikes me as a vet is the lack of awareness and understanding. As a young graduate, I was not aware enough of the association between obesity and welfare, and I had to learn the hard way, like some owners, which was all too powerful when euthanizing otherwise healthy horses because of their fat that slowly poisoned their bodies, causing EMS and subsequent laminitis. I felt sick at the realization of how preventable these deaths were. However, trying to warn owners of the risks of obesity was often difficult and ineffective. So owners just didn't see it, some of them. He's just a cob, for instance. Some saw it, but didn't think it was a problem. So he's always been fat, but he's never had laminitis. And then others saw it, knew it was a problem, but just couldn't work out how to fix it. These were the ones that sort of felt, I'm doing everything I can, but he lives on fresh air. So I had my work cut out, trying to get these owners to recognize obesity, accept it without taking offense, understand the horrific consequences if nothing was done, and lastly, empowering them to do something and stick to it, because it is a long road to success, as we know. This highlighted the biggest problem for us vets, in my opinion, which is the vet-owner relationship. So owners are clients, they're paying us for a service, 
And while an NHS GP can bluntly tell someone that they're too fat and won't get their free knee surgery until they lose three stone, we can't be like this. We risk upsetting that client, being banned from the yard, losing them to another practice, or even being met with aggression. So no vet, and no practice wants to lose a client or upset their boss in doing so. And some vets will therefore simply shy away from the subject because like some owners and yard managers, farriers, physios, instructors, etc., it's just easier to avoid the subject altogether. But if we are all being really honest with ourselves, this is neglect. And I doubt many vets would walk away from an emaciated horse or an infected wound or a cloudy eye. So why are we so willing to walk away from these ticking time bombs, which are actually a real welfare issue at risk of losing their life? So what can we do to improve engagement? Vets clearly need to be up to date in their own knowledge and obesity is not a sexy subject for anyone. So as a profession, we know we need to be proactive in educating and disseminating all the current research that's being done. Ultimately, we have a duty of care to these horses and we have to fulfill that, but we can only do it if the owner allows us to. So I would like to see vets and owners engaging over obesity and for those that are persistently stubborn or in denial, perhaps it does require some sort of brutal campaign demonstrating the pain and the suffering felt by laminitics and the agonizing end that many of these obese horses eventually succumb to. Which leads me to the frequently overseen opportunity for vets to play a vital role in weight management. We're in a unique and privileged position to help design a tailor-made solution specific to that horse and owner we can consider all the contributing factors from genetics, husbandry, exercise, diet, medical issues, behavioral issues. And with all that information, we can create an achievable and effective strategy for that horse. Vets are available to owners all around the clock and we would much rather provide advice, preventative advice, than be called to attend a case of laminitis. We want to prevent these cases before they happen. And similarly, we want to work with the owners and their farriers, their nutritionists, instructors, yard managers, recognising the importance of a welcoming team approach, hence the importance of an event like today's. So to conclude, we must all learn to stop avoiding this issue and start to engage. We need to recognise and accept that there is a problem and then we must communicate so that we can all understand the facts surrounding that case. If we're to be successful in saving that horse's life and preventing recurrence of obesity, then we must find a solution that works for both the horse and the owner, and then support these owners every step of the way. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm going to be talking this evening from the horse owner's point of view. I currently own three horses who are native or native crosses and require careful management of their diet to prevent them becoming overweight. I've owned horses for more than 40 years, during which time I've seen many changes in the way that we keep and manage our horses, which I believe is a big contributory factor to the problem of equine obesity. Like Lucy, I think that one of the main challenges for owners is recognising what's a good healthy weight for their horse. My Irish draft cross Jack, pictured here five years ago, could be described as a good doer, who always has one eye on the paddock that's greener next door and is, a, and is a great escape artist when his mind's set on something. He's always been quick to put on weight, particularly in the spring, but as we all know, it's harder to get our horses to lose weight than to put it on, which I think is one of the issues that other horse owners find that they have too. Some owners may lack sufficient knowledge to realise that their horse is overweight and able to distinguish between fat and muscle, particularly if they have a horse that's a bigger type or breed, or they may simply not want to accept that their horse is too heavy. When I had my first pony, most horses and ponies lived out year round. They were usually unrugged or wore a thin canvas New Zealand rug in winter and were fed hay and given a scoop of pony nuts or some straight feeds such as oats or barley if they needed extra energy for warmth or if they were working hard. Today, there's a huge variety of hard feed and supplements to choose from, which can be confusing. Haylage is now also popular, but do we know what its feed value is compared to hay, which is particularly important when managing the overweight or laminitic horse? Liz will talk more on this. Warmer and wetter winters in most parts of the UK now mean that the grass keeps growing for longer and paddock management often includes fertiliser, resulting in better quality grazing throughout the year. 
many horses now have long periods of time stabled in the winter with limited or no turnout, large hay nets to alleviate boredom, and they often have a vast wardrobe of rugs, so they're using fewer or no calories to keep warm, all of which contribute to the problem of equine obesity. So as owners, do we really know what we're feeding and how many calories our horses are consuming? Are we using too many rugs? And are our horses doing enough work to warrant the type and amount of feed that they're getting? Providing adequate exercise can be an issue for owners who juggle looking after their horses with busy work and family commitments. And this can be more challenging during the winter with poor weather and shorter daylight hours. Those of us with more than one horse inevitably spend less time exercising our horses and more time on management. A lack of access to safe hacking or an arena may also be an issue when trying to provide enough exercise. The popularity of social media groups also brings its own problems. I see horse owners frequently posting pictures of their horses, asking for comments from fellow group members about how their horse looks or what they should be feeding their horse that has a particular health condition, rather than seeking the opinion of their vet or a nutritionist. I posted this picture of Jack on my Facebook some years ago and it got lots of likes, but nobody commented that he looked overweight. Perhaps in situations like that, people are worried about saying something that may be construed as being rude or negative rather than being helpful. Having previously kept horses on livery yards, there's often peer pressure there too. An owner who recognises their horse is overweight and is trying to do the right thing by reducing their horse's feed may be regarded as being uncaring. Or perhaps some people may be worried about raising the issue of a fellow livery yard client's horse being overweight, when really they're only concerned for the horse's welfare. Beth and Penny will talk more on this. So what can be done to help? Owners need to be able to recognise and acknowledge that their horse has a weight problem and be motivated to take action. For my horse, Jack, pictured again here in 2020, restricting his turnout area and time and making sure that the electric fencing battery is always charged is very important to his management and maintaining a healthy weight. I'm vigilant when the grass is growing, particularly in early spring, and I use a weight tape regularly to monitor changes in his weight. He has a trickle net for his forage, and in the past few years, I've switched from feeding traditional cubes to a low calorie feed balancer and chaff, and I rarely give treats such as carrots, which are high in sugar. Jack's clipped in winter, but he only wears a lightweight rug unless it gets really cold or it's wet and windy, when he wears a medium weight rug. He's 19 now and I aim for him to be ridden three or four times a week if possible and he gets turned out most days for at least a few hours. If the paddocks are too wet to turn out and my time's limited he gets walked in hand so at least he gets some exercise. It's really helpful to talk to your vet, a nutritionist or a livery yard owner about how best to make changes to your horse's diet and management and consider carefully whether your horse needs a rug and if so what weight rug you choose. Remember that their metabolism works differently to ours. When time's short, see if you can work with other horse owners to help and support each other in managing your horses. Or if you keep your horses on your own like I do, perhaps try to enlist some additional help from someone you trust, which may give you more time to exercise your horse. Education through online media such as podcasts, YouTube videos and webinars are all ways in which horse owners can be engaged in a positive way to help tackle the problem of equine obesity. Equine weight clinics run by vet practices with the input of a nutritionist are also a helpful way to get good advice based on accurate measurement of your horse's weight and its health history. So what are the take home messages? Be truthful when assessing your horse's weight and beware of experts on social media. Feed your horse based on what they need and use regular body condition scoring and a weight tape to monitor your horse's weight and keep a record. Finally, you know your horse best, but don't be afraid to seek professional advice. Vets, nutritionists and livery yard owners all have your horse's best interests at heart. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to have been asked by the National Equine Forum to talk tonight about my experiences as a livery owner and trainer about managing horses' weight. So to give some context, I own and manage a livery yard that offers assisted and full livery services. So I'm responsible for managing all the diets. Now to do this, I need to balance each horse's nutritional needs 
with the needs and expectations of each of their owners, which on a busy yard can be quite a variety of needs, exercise requirements, and of course, making sure the horses aren't getting too fat or too excitable. I've also seen that during my time running yards, owners seem now to be preferring to have horses for leisure, less than competition. And also I found that interesting enough, owners seem to be happier to have their horses carrying more weight than they did in the past. So that can bring some challenges. One of them I find is managing a horse's diet when an owner believes that their horse is in good condition and well muscled and not fat. But we find that actually the horse is holding too much weight and is therefore at risk of further health problems. The other challenge can be managing an owner's perception that if I'm changing their horse's feed, I'm not doing this for the good of the horse, but to save money and to save my feed bill. So some potential solutions around these challenges. One key thing is monitoring their body weight and condition. We actually use someone, a nutritionist from our feed company who comes annually or if they can every six months to come and weigh our horses, use a weigh bridge and also provide body conditioning scores. This then allows us to monitor the changes in weight and condition and also keep a trend as they've been coming for eight years now so we can see changes that these horses weights might and then understand what that might mean. The other key thing is sharing these results with each owner, making sure they're aware of their horse's weight, looking at the trends with them and again discussing any changes. The other thing is using the experts around me. Um, I work with my vet and again our feed company nutritionists because they can provide impartial advice and guidance and that's been really useful. So it's not seen as me telling the owners what I think, but actually experts supporting what I'm telling them. And again, this can help us to provide the owners with impartial advice on their weight of the horse, condition of the horse, and again, any potential health issues that might arise. But I think the main thing I've found through my experience is it's about communication and trust. I've got to have a good relationship and the trust of my owners to enable me to have open discussions about their horse's diet and condition. They need to understand where I'm coming from, why I might be highlighting issues, and that I'm not just doing this because of the good of my business, but because of the good of their horse. And I think that communication and trust is key to managing each horse's weight and nutritional requirements and for keeping a happy yard and happy owners. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and suggestions, everyone. We have already received before the webinar some questions and I'd like to pick up a few of those now. So Lucy, for you, uh, Lucy, if you can join us. Hi, Lucy. A question was raised about the traffic light sticker system on passports and whether it might result in insurance companies refusing to pay out for weight related claims such as laminitis. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. Um, and certainly we're aware of that issue and we've moved away from the traffic light system to a slightly more binary system, hopefully going forward, where we, we try and point out to the owner that yes, this is a good healthy weighted horse. And we've got another sticker which will give them a QR code to link to some advice if the horse is overweight. The, the thing is the stickers don't go onto the clinical history. So that horse isn't sort of tarnished forever, if you like, as being a horse that suffered from weight problems. Um, but understandably from the insurer's point of view, there is a degree of, um, of, of them wanting to do this because actually it is a pre-existing condition that does have genuine health concerns. So a smoker, for instance, would have an issue, it would have a higher premium for getting health insurance as a human. So you can understand why they might take that view. And it is probably a good reason why we should be pushing even harder for people to, to have their horses at a healthier weight, because there is a real risk to them at the end of the day. So we have to be slightly understanding of the insurer's views. Thank you. 
Helen, a question that we were also asked was about how can owners best support and encourage each other when trying to address this problem? Well, I, I think there's a few things here and I think communication is the key issue. Um, Beth also touched on it and talked about trust and being able to have meaningful discussions. So if you're on a livery yard, for example, other owners can help each other by understanding what the owner that's got the obese horse has been asked to do. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's very important that if you've received veterinary advice and you're trying to follow that, that other people understand why you're trying to do that and how they can help. Um, if an owner is um, busy and works, you know, maybe there can be some element of practical help that we can given. So if you're going up at different times, then maybe if the horse is on a restricted diet, you can put a bit of hay in. And so that horse can have its feed split at different times throughout the day if you're on DIY system. Um, and I think, um, you know, things like help assisting with turnout, bringing in, um, if, it, if a horse has got a sheet on in the day when it's chilly first thing, can that be taken off, you know, if it, it warms up? Just the practical help where possible to assist that person in sort of meeting those targets. Um, and also, um, I think, you know, Lucy mentioned a team approach earlier on. Um, vets, far farriers, yard owners, nutritionists, I think it, it all sort of plays into how owners can be assisted in helping their horses to lose weight. Thank you. And, and Beth, uh, another questioner actually asked us, and I'll read her the question was, I know that this is dependent on what the horse is used for, but many horse owners may only exercise their horse a couple of times a week. What should a horse be doing? Yeah, that's um, a big topic, working out work balance against feed. Um, we also have livery owners on the yard who only ride their horses at weekends. So if I talk about those, that will probably help answer the question. Um, the first thing to realize is these horses are not doing very much work. So the vast majority of their nutritional requirements can be met through the fiber part of their diet, i.e. the hay and any grass they're getting if they are getting turned out. So for our horses in this situation, we don't give them any cereal hard feeds. Um, they literally just get hay and maybe a low sugar fiber feed um, to keep them happy. We make sure that they get hay rather than haylage. And again, we keep the sugar and protein levels of the feed down. If owners are worried that the horse may be not getting its nutritional requirements, um, we can feed a low calorie balancer or something like Happy Hoof that's a low sugar fibre feed. Um, we try and get all our horses out. Um, if we can't do that, again, we make sure they get out of their stable, they're walked in hand or they're lunged or they're exercised in some way every day. And we also give them hay in small hold hay nets um, to again, slow down how much they eat. So we, they're not bored when they're standing in their stables. Um, it is a challenge, but I think the key thing is making sure they don't get too much food um, and the feed is suitable for what they need, what the work level they're doing, which is really not very much. Thank you. And, and Lucy, just to sort of pick up again on this exercise, we did have a question about whether there's a difference in the amount of exercise you need to do for weight loss, as opposed to just helping to improve this insulin sensitivity. Yeah, and I think the research shows there's a huge variation. So um, much of it indicates that uh, to get your insulin sensitivity improved, then you need much less exercise than you do to actually cause weight loss. But that is going to vary so much from individual to individual that it's hard to draw some hard and fast facts. Um, but certainly what we encourage is where the water is sound enough and not in any acute laminitis, then they do need to start doing some degree of exercise um, as much as they're comfortable doing, as much as your vet suggests is appropriate, uh, in order to increase the metabolism, get the insulin sensitivity back, and then with that ongoing increasing exercise and obviously appropriate diet, will then encourage weight loss and hopefully fat being burnt, muscle being built, and then getting back to a healthy body condition. Thank you, Lucy. And um, Beth, we've just had a question in about 
loss of turnout and because of housing development in particular and it's difficult then because people have to exchange that for higher diets perhaps just how can we work with livery yard owners which is why i'm going to you to try and encourage land and how we can use land differently and how we can encourage and maintain that foraging behavior you touched on it a bit yeah i think it's really important to again have a good open dialogue with owners i mean for the moment like for example we've just had a lot of snow which melted today so we've not been able to turn out and we probably won't be turning out for at least a week so i have spoken to the livery owners explained that the horses are going to have to be in spoken to them about whether they can come up and exercise the horses or whether they need us to help them do that how we can get the horses out of their stables so again, I think it's about discussion with owners and owners being able to also approach their livery owner or yard manager to get help if they can't get up to get their horses exercised. Um, because we're all in the same situation. We've got wet winters, we've got muddy fields. Um, it can be a real challenge. And I think people are quite open to working with each other if they know they need help. But I think at the end of the day, it's about what's best for the horse. Thank you all for these great responses. Uh, we will move on to our next group and we will hear from Liz, David and Penny, who will present the equine nutritionist, showing judge and equine welfare officers perspectives. And this will again be followed by a short discussion before we go into our larger panel discussion. I'm Liz Bulbrook, an equine nutritionist and I've been advising and working with horse owners on all aspects of nutrition over the last 30 years. When it comes to managing our horse's weight, this can be quite challenging for our owners, especially if there are constraints on feed, management and exercise changes. And this is equally applicable to the underweight horse. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges we see and some of the solutions from the perspective of a nutritionist. Initially, when working with our horse owners, it's understanding what is their perception of what they consider to be an acceptable healthy weight for their horse in relation to its overall body condition, shape and stamp. Horses and ponies body condition score is frequently underestimated with comments such as he's well covered, but that's his type or he's naturally a good doer. There's a lack of understanding as to what defines an overweight horse or pony whether it be the leisure horse or your competition horse. There appears to be a lack of differentiation between body fat, muscle and top line, as well as understanding cresty necks. And unfortunately, in some cases, there can be a willing, unwillingness to acknowledge that their horse or pony has perhaps gained more weight than is ideal. Certainly what we tend to see today that's accepted as the normal is generally fatter than 20 years ago. So what is the other challenge we often see? And that is understanding the nutritional value of our forage and our feed. There's a lack of understanding of what maybe hay, haylage, grass is actually offering to the horse's diet. It's not just based on the time of year. Just because we're going into winter doesn't necessarily mean that it's of less feed value. We see milder winters, we're see, seeing changing environmental conditions, and this can all contribute to the quality and quantity of the forage and therefore the calorie contribution. We see that the focus is placed on the calorie content of the bag of feed, how much starch and sugar and how much is that compound feed giving to the daily diet. It's not so much how much is fed, but what role does the bucket feed have in that total daily diet? We, the feed industry, I think still struggle getting the message across about providing optimum nutrition and a balanced diet to complement the forage. It's not just about the bag of feed. So what are the solutions? Firstly, as an industry, we need to encourage the horse owner to seek advice and support from nutritionists and feed companies and their vet and discuss the weight management of their horses. We need to continue to be proactive in explaining and educating how the hands-on approach to body condition scoring works and how it can be used as an objective assessment of weight management 
body fat distribution based on recognized descriptive points. And this could be using a body condition scoring on one to nine or the one to five, but they all have descriptions that you can follow. Using body condition scoring can then be combined with the other weight monitoring tools, such as weigh bridges, weigh tapes. Because remember, body weight alone is of limited use when assessing the current physical status of the horse without moving on to the hands-on approach. And what about the other solution when it comes to understanding our forages and our feeds? Again, it's about education and it's about knowledge. It's really important that as a nutritionist or a feed company, the message is delivered about how good a balanced diet is because it will help with the overall metabolism, i.e. the burning of the calories, and the health and welfare of our horses. It's about being informative about what goes into our feeds and why different feeds are designed the way they are. This will then help my owners make an informed choice on selecting the most appropriate product. However, it's also about explaining what the forages can deliver. Forage is more than just bulk. It's a significant calorie content to the daily diet. So amending the bucket feed is not going to be the quick fix in controlling our horse's excess weight. Different types of grasses and hay species can deliver an enormous variation in the calorie and sugar content of the daily diet. But we know no forage alone is going to give a balanced diet. Therefore, we have to give vitamins and minerals through concentrated feed. These feeds will give a negligible amount of calories to the daily diet. So again, it's about looking at the complete picture. So in summary, it's about communication. It's important that we listen to our horse owners, look at what we're trying to do in controlling their weight. We ask questions and we ask what are they trying to achieve and what areas might they struggle in. We can then help make a practical solution tailored for their situation. And remember, it's a long-term program trying to get weight off our horses or even put weight on our horses. It's not a quick fix. So we have to offer areas that can be worked on, find appropriate solutions. It's not a one size fits all. And remember, nutritionists and feed companies are there to help you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to, to be part of this um, discussion. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Ingle. I'm chairman of the Showing Council at the moment, have been for several years, and I'm also showing director or director of showing at the Royal International and the Derby meeting at Hickstead. Um, so I come, come at this from quite a few different angles and we, we see quite a lot of different things and we um, we talk about quite a lot of information and, and uh, a great weight debate is quite interesting because we've been talking about things surrounding this for quite a while. One of the biggest challenges uh, for showing is, is how we bring a lot of this information together and the showing council is evolved of 17 stroke 18 separate showing organisations and that's growing all the time. Um, and we are not a governing body. Most organisations like dressage, eventing, show jumping, they have a centralised governing body. And so it's a, a, arguably a little bit easier to centralise those discussions and come up with agreement and, and implement them and disseminate them. Uh, but in showing it's not quite so easy because um, um, we, we have to gain consensus of opinion and talk and openly talk and it's a great platform but at the end of the day it's up to all the different individual member bodies what they wish to do and how they wish to do it but we do try and garner opinion and, and input really best practice and good help into that and we've had great success with that platform with things like unifying the hat standard talking about dope testing implementing safeguarding and child protection policies um, there's quite a lot of things so this this format does work and and it's very very helpful so um, I'm confident that we can we can use what we have to help talk about about this this topic and further it one thing we have done is introduce a welfare policy that happened two years ago uh, in conjunction with the bhs who helped us hugely um, and we're about to um, jump into an annual review of that with the help of the bhs and world horse welfare who have both very kindly agreed to sit as observers and um, help as and when necessary and advise so that's really exciting that should be in july um, and we're also very conscious of the social licensing. We've been talking about that for quite a long time too. And uh, we're, we're beginning to see that um, 
uh, bear fruit and that, that's changing the way people are thinking and how they're reacting um, as well. So I'm um, showing, you know, is it is it fit or is it fat? Um, I mean, in past years, yes, I'm sure showing has had quite a lot of talk about fat horses. Um, and I'm sure there probably still are some as there are in other disciplines, but on the whole, they are fit and well covered, which is a very different thing. And actually, you could argue, how do we know that? Well, we know that because we have done some uh, very good work with Tam Zinfatada, who's part of uh, this group today. And um, in 2019, the Royal International opened the doors to Tamsin and her research project on uh, condition scoring of horses, body condition scoring of horses. And she had access for a whole day on Thursday, which is arguably a premier day of the show, hunters, etc. And she it was, you know, she'd have access to whatever she wanted, work with the judges, condition score every horse. And uh, as far as I know it, Tamsin, I don't think we had a single obese one. And we had an enormous amount of, you know, spot on ones. So, if, you know, the, the statistics are showing that a lot of good work has already happened, but that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be doing a lot more. And getting information out there is really, really important. Um, uh, we could put, what could the Shown Council do to help this as well as talk about it? We could formulate a page on our website to really help with uh, creating a hub or signposting of information, particularly of what comes out of today and around the eminent speakers that, that we're hearing um, and start to help people know where to find information because I'm sure that really is a difficult challenge. Um, and we will also talk about adding this topic to the agendas of all our member bodies and helping them maybe formulate conversations with judges, competitors, how we talk about this subject. We make it easier for people to talk about. It's not easy for judges to say what they want or need to say at times. It can be very, very challenging. It's easy to say a judge should just tell somebody doesn't always work quite that easily. Judges are a huge range of ability, experience, et cetera, et cetera. And also some people don't feel comfortable with that. And some competitors wouldn't feel comfortable with that. But I'm sure by talking about this, we will be able to come up with a much better way forward. And from today, we will learn a lot. So, you know, I'm confident that the Showing Council has a lot to input here and a big part to play in helping our member bodies reach a better place and uh, play a much more active part in disseminating good, up-to-date scientific information to help those are questions that need it in showing and other areas too, obviously. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Penny Baker. I work for the charity World Horse Welfare and my role as an equine welfare field officer means I investigate calls from the public where there's believed to be a welfare concern. This is my 16th year of working on the front line of welfare, having previously worked as an RSPCA inspector and so I have a range of experience for the welfare issues that the UK currently faces. With the problem of equine obesity still rising, what is commonly recognised as the right weight or an ideal weight for a horse is still causing problems for many owners. I've seen firsthand how quickly society can judge and condemn the owner of a thin horse as neglectful, but society does not judge the owner of a fat horse in the same manner. Owners of underweight horses are often thought of as being neglectful, but those with an overweight horse can be seen as kind when overfeeding or overcaring, with rugging being particularly an issue, or it being cute even that the horse is chubby. There have been occasions when I myself have been challenged about why I'm visiting horses that are clearly well loved, indicating that overweight horses are often not seen as being a welfare concern. Historically, the area of welfare has been associated with underweight horses, and whilst that association probably hasn't changed, the UK's equine problems certainly have. In relation to reporting welfare concerns, do the public report overweight horses in the same volume as underweight horses? These figures, taken over four years from the reports made to World Horse Welfare, would suggest not, with significantly less calls about the overweight horse than its counterpart. In 2020, we only received 58 calls of concern about overweight horses compared to 620 for the underweight horse. However, frontline officers will all be able to recount visits that they've made where there's been no mention of a horse being overweight and yet it's identified by the officer. Likewise, we've also visited horses categorised as underweight only to find that they aren't. The calls that World Horse Welfare receives about overweight horses are often about animals which now already have the associated health issues, laminitis, lameness, EMS and Cushing's. The period before such time would be a preventative zone and so that's the phase at which owners seem to struggle the most. 
in my experience, there are more owners who will recognise a horse that is body condition score four and a half out of five, but far less owners who would recognise a horse that is three and a half out of five. In the horses that we rescue, it's our experience at World Horse Welfare, where we rehabilitate approximately 300 to 350 horses a year, that the ones with the most guarded outcomes as prospects of successful rehabilitation are those who arrive obese and suffering from the conditions associated with obesity. The flip side of this is that we can rehabilitate a thin horse much more quickly if there are no other underlying conditions and can return it to full health without any lasting damage than we can for those in the OB sector. I personally believe there are two categories for owners as to why overweight horses are not identified as such. We have the owners who have equine weight issues and know the problem is there, but perhaps stigma stops them from admitting it, coupled with the fact that suitable facilities and time and lifestyle and commitment are then factors that need changing in order to achieve the results. Suggesting adjustments to these factors are challenging and humans often find change difficult. And then there are those owners who lack correct knowledge, genuinely believing that their horse isn't overweight, conditioned by what has become the norm for so many owners. We've recently experienced some excellent results with the use of human behavioural change techniques, one of those being the use of boosting self-efficacy defined as a person having a strong positive belief that they can have the capacity and the skills to achieve their goals. At World Horse Welfare, we have as an organisation been training our staff in a human behavioural change technique called motivational interviewing, which has been described as a way of having powerful conversations about difficult issues. And there is strong evidence for its effectiveness in helping people change problematic behaviours. The world has moved on and in welfare, we look for multiple methods of addressing issues, bearing in mind the analogy of telling a smoker to quit is not a successful method of change in many, if not all instances, and the same really does apply in welfare. Turning to the human health sector for evidence, if we look at what methods are most successful in slimming groups, group support facilities, as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions are proven to gain the best long-term sustainable results. Research has shown that people who utilise these facilities lose more weight than those who try to make efforts alone. We know from looking at social media that people love to share their stories with like-minded folk and that such stories have gone on to be inspiring to others. Perhaps this social media era is the platform that we should utilise to share these success stories and form equine weight loss swimming groups with one place to go, providing tried and tested reliable information. To conclude, from my welfare work, I can identify for certain three factors. Firstly, that many owners still need help to identify what is the optimal weight their horse should be. That owners with overweight equines need to be honest and scrutinise their own human behaviour and how that impacts their equine's health. And in equine welfare, the tides are turning and we see more overweight related issues than ever before. Thank you so much to our latest three panellists for these thought-provoking insights. Liz, if I could ask you to expand a little bit on the comment that Beth mentioned that if you're feeding a forage-only diet, you need to put a balancer to combine with that and whether how do you work with owners that are more based on the traditional forms of feeding, how can we persuade them to change onto those modern ways of a lower calorie and balancers and chaff and a forage based diet? Um, I think the challenge um, of getting some of these owners to understand moving from traditional feeds to our modern methods is to have an open discussion with them and to overcome their concerns. Many owners I think with weight management issues are struggling with the concept of the smaller bucket feed so it's important we understand, we explain what a balancer is and what it's there to provide. It's not just about halving the amount of your traditional feed and reducing the calories because then the diets become unbalanced and it's gonna have very limited influence on weight management. It's really important then that we explain what a balance is there to do, that it's going to be providing concentrated vitamins, minerals, 
with insignificant calories compared to the total diet. And if an owner is concerned about wanting to see more in the bucket and chew times, etc., increased, then we can recommend high fiber, low calorie balancers. Perhaps they could go towards soaked feeds like unmolassed chaffs, where you're putting a very small amount of dry feed, um, sorry, unmolassed beet, small amount of dry feed into water and more bulk. So again, there's plenty of chew time. So it's really important we engage with the owners so that they can understand that what we're trying to do is provide a diet that is nutrient rich for the general health and well-being of the horse, but is calorie poor to assist with their weight management. Thank you, Liz. David, we've got, a, um, I think, a concern that show competitors fear that they will lose if the horse in the ring is the right weight when the others in the ring are, as you said, well covered. Could you discuss that a bit more? Yeah, I mean, that's a very sad thing if people do feel like that. And I think the way to change that opinion is, is to show your horse in the best possible condition. Um, because by people, because it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people feel that they, they're not doing well enough because the horse isn't big enough and they get it bigger, then, then it, the horses aren't there to judge. The judge can only judge what's put in front of them. And I think if someone's confused, they should also ask, be prepared to ask the judge or ask the secretary, you know, what what happened you know or I don't understand can you help me because it's much easier to discuss it when a horse is actually in front of you um, and particularly if it's a you know a judge that's, that's very experienced most judges will talk to you um, particularly you know um, if it's about a concern like this um, so they shouldn't feel like that and I would be really disheartened if they did and they must keep going and they must enjoy it it is supposed to be fun and your horse is meant to be healthy um, and that's the whole point of it. So if they stop going, it doesn't help solve the problem. And if people make sure their horses are in the right condition and go, then it really does send a good message that things are changing. And with the work that we did at the Royal International last year with Tamsin, what we did learn there was that most horses are at a, a, in, a in a very good condition. Um, not that that you know absolves anybody of anything but um i'd be very sad to think people felt they were being left out because their horse was not uh you know not fat enough and that would be about be an awful thing yes david and just i'm uh just to pick up a little bit from that we have been asked about people who and again um that when they look in on magazines that there may be overweight and obese animals that are pictured as winners which i think again it picks up on this issue so can you expand what you're trying to expand outside of the, the initial work you're doing? Yes, it's about initiating these conversations and, and, and ensuring that we talk about this stuff, because for so long it has not really been openly talked about. We saw this with the rider weight debate as well. The suitably mounted project was the same thing. The hardest thing was starting the conversation. So in order to do what we're doing tonight is great because it really acts as a as a catalyst even though lots of discussion has gone on so it is about having those conversations and also you know people need to be responsible about what photographs they are using what they are promoting and also we need to you know sometimes what we see on a photograph isn't exactly what we see you know what, what what it is and i'm not excusing the photograph or the fact the animal may or may not be overweight but they're not all, always as overweight as they perceive because people things can be done with photographs to change them so we need to be careful that we don't victimize people i mean you know talking to what penny was saying you know the sort of pointing technique and and, and picking people out because that isn't the way to go about this picking people off one by one you know we all have a, a social responsibility here to do the right thing and educate and communicate and I think that's an overwhelming message that's coming through. And, and so, so for me, what, what, what I'm taking away from this is definitely the piece that I mentioned, which is discussing it with our member bodies and actually talking to our judges about it and saying, you know, what, what are we doing about this? Do you understand bodies condition scoring? I mean, really understand it. And, and are you prepared to talk to somebody about it? And if not, why not? And what help can we give you? And where, where can we go for that? Thank you very much for addressing that, David. I think that's very helpful. And it does lead on really Penny on that whole question is if we're trying to encourage, you know, we were asked before that do we think more prosecutions under the Animal Welfare Act is part of the answer? Picks up a bit of what David said. Um, I think I think the law plays its part, obviously, in, in you know, equine welfare and generally it does that well. 
Um, but I think we also recognise struggles that the UK faces with enforcement. And so when it comes to this topic, I think we really have to be looking at upping our game when we talk about working with owners and not having to force them. Um, really, the law should be reserved for the most serious cases. And what we're talking about here is a much more common widespread problem. And so that needs collaborative working between the owners and professionals. Um, enforcement doesn't always bring about lasting change. So I think from my point of view, it's, it's very much about working together in a, to enable us to move forward. Thank you, Penny. And, and Liz, we had a question, um, which hopefully will have a very quick answer is, can you approach feed companies for advice as an individual? Yes, you can. <laughs> it's, it's the easy answer. Anybody, I think all feed companies have got helplines, um, advice centres, you can ring them up, they have Facebook pages. So yes, we're very approachable. And again, very briefly, another question came about uh, training and educating store feed stores as well as the nutritionists. And how does that, how can you work with the feed stores? I think most of us as feed companies now with our um, account managers, they have training opportunities with feed stores. We have what we call merchant knowledge awards or various sort of terminology, whereby going into the feed store and working with those key um, salespeople that are there, the face to face contact with the horse owner. I think we do work with them so that if you don't feel you want to phone up an individual company, you can at least talk to your feed store. And if they don't know, most good feed stores will then pick up the phone to the feed company. So it's all about just building that relationship. Thank you very much. And I, I think at this point, I'd really like to introduce Tamsin who is a researcher at the University of Liverpool, where she completed her PhD about the drivers of equine obesity, so very relevant to today's debate. But her specialism is in the human side of how we can look differently at our society, culture and environment in order to help us to find long term changes that will help to tackle the issue of obesity. Uh, Tamsin would also like to point out that she's also had native ponies herself, so she also understands the difficulties of managing obesity from a horse owner point of view. So Tamsin, I think having heard and some of the questions, could you perhaps provide a view of what you think has come out of the discussion so far, the questions and the brief presentations from our panellists, really to do with human behavioural change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, well, this has been music to my ears, I have to say, as a researcher in human behaviour change and equine obesity, which is why I was so excited about this debate, because it's really the first time that we've brought together multiple different stakeholders rather than kind of picking on, you know, picking on horse owners or picking on the feed or show industry, but rather kind of starting from scratch, bringing it all together and talking about the issues we have and how we can overcome them. So there are some common themes that have been picked up. Um, I think we've heard a lot about uh, the difficulty with recognizing obesity for horse owners. And this is absolutely no surprise um, because we, we see the same thing in parents with children. There's been lots of research on this. Also uh, dog owners and research has shown it with horse owners as well that we can understand on a, a kind of wider general level that um, obesity is a, a really big problem in our equine or human society, but actually recognizing it in our own animal that we love and we see every day is what's really hard or our own child. <laughs> so um, there's lots of research in human medicine about how we can overcome that. Um, and what's really nice is that one of the ways to overcome it is one of the other themes that's been repeatedly echoed today, which is about the importance of teamwork, better communication and what Penny outlined so nicely about um, the importance of empowering people and working with them, you know, those ideas of um, it's not telling someone they're fat, it's helping them with, um, you know, kind of slimming worlds is very supportive and so on. So it's that that empowering, helping people to take, you know, step by step changes rather than just telling them there's an issue and expecting them to uh, do something about it. So I think that theme around um, teamwork and the importance of better communication, empowering people and so on um, is really important. So yeah, I'm hoping we can discuss those a bit more in the panel discussion with all six speakers. Next. Thank you very much. And that really brings us nicely onto the panel. And what I would like to do is pick up on some of the themes that we had of the questions we received before this webinar and also some of them that have come through. 
And there does seem to be uh, a starting theme about this whole idea of recognition and realization. And I think, Lucy, if I could come to you, we've been sort of asked about how do you recommend to start the conversation on weight and body condition without losing this trust and without appearing to judge? And with this, does the language you use make a difference to the response you receive when you address this issue? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really critical point to make. And certainly in my own experiences, we get some very inflammatory words, which some people will take very badly, and you immediately switch them off the subject and disengage them. Uh, and versus you'll get some people which, if you use too lighthearted, too sugared a pill, will actually not realise the seriousness of what you're trying to tell them. So it's about gauging that individual when you're talking to them. And something that I learned from one of the Beaver obesity campaign pilots that we ran with the flu vaccination stickers um, from one of the um, people that participated, one of the vets, was that it's really good to engage the owner and ask them what they think. So one of, one of the ways would be to open up the conversation to say, how do you think um, Trigger is coming out of winter this time round? You know, do you think he's put on a bit of weight more than last time and uh, last time when I saw him? And that's a really good way to open the conversation because then you can gauge a little bit as to how that owner feels themselves. And some of them may already know their horse is overweight and, and needs to do something about it, whereas others may not even be aware that it's, it's, a, it's, it's the horse is fat. So I tend to ask about the horse's weight and then I will always make sure I use the word fat pads because whilst weight is not going to immediately turn somebody off, it's really important you do use the word fat pads because if you start talking about condition, I think it can be misinterpreted as being a good thing. So I always talk about weight as an opener. And then I say these fat pads here. And that's when you see some owners really switch a light bulb on and go, ah, okay, I thought that was muscle. I thought that was top line. And you start to really gauge their interest and their understanding. And then you can direct the conversation appropriately, really, depending on the person. Thank you. And, and David, just to pick up a bit on that answer from Lucy, do you think certainly, and again, it comes back with the showing that there is some confusion about what is fat and what is muscle? Uh, yes, I, I, I do. And I think, um, or the, I think there must be from what we're seeing, um, because uh, although possibly some people might be in denial, and I, and I don't use that um, easily or, or mean to offend or be rude but it's just about having a challenging conversation um, and I think if if you don't know you shouldn't be afraid not to know and ask questions and learn and we live I think arguably in a society where people like or feel they need or should know things that they actually don't and they come into horses or ponies quite quickly they don't necessarily know what they should do and yet they think they daren't ask because they look silly or feel stupid I'm obsessed with learning things, still am, and I'm 54, and, and I love asking questions. Being on here tonight and having done the work to prepare for tonight um, is great because you get to hear and see and learn things that I didn't necessarily know myself already. So, so I, just, I think, you know, we should have an appetite to learn. So I think it is, it does, it is difficult, and I think the challenge is making sure people have the opportunity to know what the difference is and we see this not just in showing but other disciplines and of course showing is a focus for well covered horses or horses that are perceived as fat because because it's part of part of its history I suppose and we've moved into a different era and are definitely moving into a different era and I'm proud of that but we need to keep going and I think with that we need to make sure people are educated into what these horses are and whether they're fit enough because to go showing they must be fit because if you go to some showgrounds, if we take Hickstead as a, for instance, which is, you know, a particular place I love, but it's also a very challenging place to ride, which is the nature of a championship track. The horse needs to be fit to do it. And, um, and so it should be fit to go anywhere and do any job that it's appropriate for. And um, so, so your understanding of, of what a fit horse is, if your horse is fit, it'll look right. It will look right if it's fit and well prepared, um, but it won't look right if it's just fed and fed and fed and not really worked. And so we see those challenges of riding a couple of days a week and still wanting to compete perhaps. And, and how do we bring that closer together? Yes, thank you. And I just, um, Finally, just on that kind of area, we did get a question about do ring judges actually get CPD on right weight, which picks up on your other about understanding this. So 
I think they should, shouldn't they? <laughs> By the sound of it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we definitely need to talk about. I mean, yes, in, it, historically, from my knowledge, we've talked about it over the years. I, I've been to several presentations as a judge on body condition scoring over the years, and it's evolved how it's done and, and different ways in which it's done. But I think it never hurts to keep going with that. There's more and more information available. Um, and, and we have plans as well for the Royal International, for instance, for Tamsin to come back and be a little bit more open and a bit more public. Not that she wasn't before, but we, we realized we could do more with it and people were fascinated. So we thought, great, there's an opportunity and we're going to do it. Um, we have challenges with COVID, but we will overcome those and we will do it um, if Tamsin's still keen. <laughs> Thank you. and and and. Penny, I think when we take it away from it, you know, we talked here about the, the show judges, but I think one of the problems we've identified is the owners struggling to recognise. And, it, you know, as Lucy said, it's really important that they do recognise. So what more can we do to help them? You know, we're educating, talking about educating the show judges, but how do we help, help to educate the owners? I think, I think we, we have to look at carefully at that word educate because whilst that applies to you know some if not many owners there's also the other side of it that people do recognize that there's a problem but the part that's a problem is recognizing what the barriers to change are so for example the person that might be on a diy livery yard may not have particular control over the restricted grazing option that they might recognize they need and therefore that might lead to them having to look at the possibility of moving a yard it, another yard could be further away, it could be more money. So there are barriers to change um, for, for that person and the barriers for each individual will be different. And so recognizing those barriers is a good place to start. Um, I think from the sort of public perception point of view, you know, sadly there is still this um, peer pressure that you can often you know, see on yards or social standing um, and that's definitely something that we have to work on as a, as a general conception throughout. I think the media is probably the right place to start with that. Thank you. And then just a, 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 Lucy, we've just had a, just another question on this theme. And actually, it didn't come from me, but it was about how do we improve um, nutrition training of vets? Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good point. I think the unfortunately the, the veterinary curriculum is so jam-packed, even for a five, six year course, it is really rammed with stuff already, as you can imagine, teaching everything there is to know about every species in a medical sense, that it's it doesn't leave much room for individual specific focus subjects like equine nutrition. Um, you know, I was at uni quite a few years ago now, but we got very little teaching on it. We got some real basics and that was it. And if you don't actively go and seek to update your knowledge as part of your continuing professional development, which we're required to do every year, if you don't choose to look at equine nutrition as a subject, then it's, it's possible you may not update your knowledge through your career. So um, that in itself comes down to vets taking a specific interest and actually waking up and realizing how important it is that we do understand equine nutrition. Having said that, that is also a very really good point of where we should be working as a team because I can't keep up to date on absolutely everything that my job entails um, on, a, on a daily or weekly or monthly or even annual basis. It's just not possible. Whereas if I have a good relationship with the nutritionists in my area, which I hopefully do, um, then by discussing and working together on cases, we, we share that information and it's, and it's case based and it's individually tailored and then we learn different sort of tricks of the trade off each other and that's how I keep engaged with equine nutrition I obviously try and read articles when when I can but really by having those human relationships with specialists in those areas like nutrition is how you learn and how you get to pick up on on what you should be doing day in day out with your cases so I kind of try and encourage equine vets qualified equine vets to do it that way bearing in mind really that universities are very tight for time and that is just a fact that we can't get round. Thank you we can continue to debate but I think it really leads as you say to understanding and working together but Liz on the understanding going on to the next theme I think on this understanding is very much about do you think there is and you mentioned it but this lack of understanding about calories contained in feed grass and pre preserved forage could you just pick that up a bit? Yes, yeah, certainly, Pat. I mean, I think there is 
definitely this lack of understanding because I think a lot of assumptions are often made and it's been touched upon by Beth and Helen in that sometimes owners listen to other owners and their assumptions are made without the facts. So I think where we see, we see as nutritionists by doing analysis, a lot of variation between haze, haylages and grass, there is often that assumption that one size fits all. And I think we come across the issue that if you're feeding hay, well, it must be less rich, lower in non-structural carbohydrates and sugars than haylage, for example, because haylage smells lovely. It's got a really nice sweet smell to it. Yet actually the process of preserving it and siling it can lead to lower sugar levels because um, these are being fermented. However, we know that hay also can, haylage can be more digestible. So the horse might gain more calories from it, which cancels out the lower sugar. And those facts we as nutritionists have to try and get across in our education. Um, so, and again, we talk about winter time. If it's above five degrees and it's mild and it's sunny, we know the grass is going to grow. So I think there is an understanding and it's our job to get that message across but if we're trying to get weight off our horses and 90% of their diet is forage and only 10% is in the bucket, we need to focus on the forage as well. And I think sometimes that does get forgotten about. Yeah, and the other thing that we need to think about um, is obviously that it's, it's that balance between energy in and energy out. And so I think, Beth, if I could ask you just to talk about this again, to pick up this understanding of how much exercise a horse is actually doing yeah again there can be a misunderstanding um, about how much work a horse is doing and I think particularly in the winter when we're not able to hack out as much we're maybe stuck doing more flat work it's cold and also we sometimes think we because we're working hard as a rider our horse is working as hard as us and it's not always the case. Um, I know we've got some horses on our yard that are incredibly good at conserving their energy. Um, and they, the owners may think they're doing quite a lot of work. Their heart rate's really not going up very much at all. Um, so I think it's important to really think about what work the horse is doing when you're riding it. There are also now some tools. There's some phone apps that will tell you when you're riding how much time you spent in walk, trot and canter that can actually be really useful because it can be quite a surprise. You think you may be doing more than you're actually doing. Um, so it's helpful to look at ways that we can get a better idea of actually what the horse is doing um, and maybe think hard about how much work they're doing and whether the food is the right food for that level of work. Thank you, Beth. And, and Helen, we've been having quite a few questions about peer pressure and from an owner's point of view on yard, you know, if you think your horse is overweight and others don't and they think you're not being careful and you're not caring for the horse, could you sort of do that? Because that's come up in a couple of questions, this peer pressure from a horse owner's point of view. I think there's several different types of peer pressure. And I think the first is what you mentioned. So if you're in a yard situation where there are other people that perceive when you're trying to get your horse to lose weight by giving less hay, giving less hard feed, taking that rug off um, that if they don't have sufficient knowledge about the problem that you're facing they may perceive that that is uncaring and I had a situation like that as a yard I was on some years ago and I was also talking today to a friend in the Midlands who's had a laminitic horse for years and she actually left a yard because of that and she's got a little cob that um developed laminitis when it was nine it's now 28 because she's managed it correctly but she moved actually to a competition yard where she felt people could understand and help her better um, than where she was previously I know that's not always going to be the case for people and I know as um, Penny said earlier on there are limitations if you haven't got yards in the area that can cater better for your needs um, so I do think that trying to educate the people where you are is a very important part of taking that pressure off yourself so that they can understand why you're doing it and you know if you explain why your vet why a nutritionist 
has actually advised you to do this. And, you know, if they can see that your horse has got an obvious problem like laminitis, then, you know, that is good enough reason, I think, where why they should be to try to help you out. But I think the other problem is social media. And I think that's a big problem because people are constantly asking on social media. I see it every day. Um, my horse has got this particular issue. What do you suggest I do with it? And then you get a hundred different replies. And you know, if you're asking dietary questions, well, I feed this or I feed that, or I think you should be doing this. And not only can that be very misleading because the individuals don't know the horse, but where does the person who asked the question then decide to go from there? Because they've got a hundred different answers. Um, and the other problem I see in, is that we put peer pressure on ourselves in that we're all on Facebook these days or some sort of social media. And, you know, we've all got friends and we see friends buying the latest rug and that. And, you know, they say, to you, oh, gosh, look at this. And we know what we're like, you know, if we want to go out and buy a new pair of shoes ourselves, you know, oh, so and has got a really nice pair of Dubarries or something. I want those Dubarries. And it's a bit like that with rugs. And I'm as guilty as anyone. Anyone who knows me will know that I've had a thousand rugs in my lifetime. I sell most of my rugs that are virtually new because I don't use them on my horses because I don't really need them. Um, and it's actually realising what you do need and what you don't. So taking that pressure off yourself and that's a, a sort of reverse sort of sort of peer pressure, if you like. Thank you, Helen. I mean, I think there's a lot of points there and I think it leads us in a way that there are multiple aspects when coming up with this plan on how to manage an individual horse. And I think, again, to Lucy, I'd just like to hear from you a little bit about we've been asked, you know, what are the main challenges when you go into a yard and you're trying or, or an individual owner when you're trying to come up with a plan for that person and that horse? I think the key is listening and looking at what they're telling you and what you're seeing, because Yes, there's sometimes a discrepancy in what the owner thinks they're doing and what they're actually doing. So it's important to pick up on that, you know, go and actually look at the feed, go and see how much they're putting in the bucket. I'm not suggesting they're lying to you overtly, but they just might not be um, quite honest with themselves. Um, but yeah, I think taking into account all those different elements that are, are actually having an influencing effect on the horse's weight. So from feed to exercise to horses other health conditions that might be some sort of lameness or old age or back pain uh, the grass and the grazing you know is it out with companions and is it moving around is it having to mooch about for different things is it clipped is it rubbed you know having a look at all those different factors and then putting together a conclusion on that is what's really key and that's going to vary from one horse to another even under the same owner so it's really important to take every horse as a kind of blank sheet, a blank canvas, and then build up what's going on now with a real honest lot of evidence <laughs> just you know, discovered between yourself and the owner. And then look at little areas where that can be tweaked and adjusted. And that's where this kind of David Brailsford type approach, as I like to think of it, comes in with the vet, because I think that we can hopefully have that kind of oversight on all those different elements and help that owner to achieve really, really achievable goals, like to actually find something that they can really put into practice, because it's no good giving them advice which they can't put into practice. You know, it's no good saying, do some strip grazing if they've got absolutely no control at a livery yard over how they graze those horses. Whereas you might be able to make a huge impact on the hard feed and the hay and the rugging and the clipping and the exercise. So tailoring your answer for that owner is what's absolutely vital with these cases and that helps them then stick to the plan. Lucy that that's really good because it shows this interrelationship and coming on from that about coming up with the plan and working if necessary with a nutritionist. Liz for you you know um, we've got some detailed questions that we'll hopefully pick up later about you know how do we help with some of these animals with grazing muzzles and with um, choosing how to provide the forage. But for you, what are your, the challenges you face when you're coming up with that nutritional plan, taking all of those questions in, on board? Thanks, Pat. I think the biggest challenge we come up with is we can talk to the owners and they can tell us exactly what they're putting in the bucket. 
They can tell you the starch and sugar content of that feed because they phoned up every feed company to ask about the sugar and starch of the feed. But unfortunately, they don't always know how much hay they're actually feeding or how much forage they're feeding. Um, if we're going to advise um, for a weight loss program, we might be saying you need to feed one and a half percent of its body weight per day. And if they don't know the horse's body weight and they don't know the weight of the hay net or how many slices of hay that actually weighs, we get told I'm feeding four slices a day or I'm feeding two good hay nets. The challenge is to be able to say, right, well, let's get the basics right. Can you get us this information? And then we can move forward with you. And the other challenge, again, as Lucy, um, I think, said, they can't always change all the management. So if we're saying feed slightly less, but spread it through the day, and they can only go to the yard twice a day, can they work with somebody else? Or can we put it in trickle nets? Those are some of the challenges. We can't just say, do this. We have to listen to what they can do and what they can't do, and then work with them and communicate where how we're going to come up with the program. Thank you, Liz. And, and just, David, we've had one in, and uh, it's, it's a little bit left field, but I'm sure you can answer it. Is One of the problems is that for some people, they're not able to ride the horse very much, you know, more than a walk, and there's increasingly, you know, how do you think we can work to help owners so they can increase the exercise, that they can build that relationship to help with the exercise more as a horse owner and someone experienced? Do you have any thoughts there? Is that, I mean, it depends why they, they're not able to exercise it too much. So I don't know if that's environment or knowledge. Or I think experience. Well, the question was about being scared of exercising. It was a particular, I was okay. scared of going faster and it was more on that building that confidence and i think really again it's reaching out for help so you know talking to people who are more experienced than yourself that we we, we, ha we have them all around us it's just being able to approach the right people people that you're on the same wavelength with and you know we're not going to get on with everybody so so getting to ride together with someone else getting good educational help and challenging yourself to achievable goals to start with. So not just going to a show and frightening yourself witless. I mean, we need to go in small incremental steps and learn because if, because the horse is also, or the, or the pony or the horse is also gonna need you to help it. So they pick up on all of that behavior. So it's going to cause all sorts of problems if we don't prepare. So it, it, it is about preparation. Um, so education first around not being scared so you you empower yourself really again back to penny's conversation which has been sort of quite pivotal about you know putting people in the driving seat and giving them the uh, ability to to learn progress get better and educate and then um, go at a step that you can you can go at. and i think also you know people look today particularly around showing and other disciplines at trying to go in at quite a high level and actually there's so much unaffiliated um competition which is incredibly important there's arguably probably not enough there used to be lots lots more um but but of course everyone's fascinated with winning big straight away and quickly well actually that's not helpful to people and it's certainly not help, helpful to animals and it doesn't help this, this this weight issue either so um so starting small go slowly get help from people that you trust and that you know have had experience, not tell you they've had it, but you visit, you can see it, it, it is tangible um, and that you respect and then work slowly and give yourself small achievable goals because that will encourage you, um, you know, give yourself a fighting chance to succeed. And I think that leads on to, you know, this whole thing about how do we implement and, you know, taking those small steps. And really I want to come again, you know, Beth to you, and, and again, picking up a bit on this peer pressure and, and how from your and the livery yard owners, how does the peer pressure stop people implementing those small steps? Um, for me, it would be things like the grazing muzzle and that peer pressure around there. So any thoughts and comments on that? Yeah, I think it's really difficult when you're on a big yard with lots of people who have all different experiences and it can be daunting. I think it can come from a lack of confidence in your what you, you feel you're doing the right thing. Um, every yard has a different feel. Um, our yard isn't very big, which helps. I think I've been on all sorts of different yards. I've been on competition yards, 
which again can be very daunting when you're trying to ride your dressage horse and you've got people watching you who are doing Grand Prix and you're at prelim. So I think we've all experienced that feeling um, that maybe you're not doing the right thing. Um, and I think it's about, again, talking to people, finding colleagues who support you on the yard that can help you, um, trusting your instincts. Um, again, going back to working with experts who do know the answer and giving you that confidence that yes, if you feel you need to put a grazing mu muzzle on your pony and your vet's told you that, and then you, you speak to the nutritionist and they tell you that, you feel then at least you've got some backing. Um, and yeah, it's a tough one, but I think it's about, again, being confident um, in what you're doing and being open to speaking to the yard owners and others about why you're doing things. And I think for our yard, I found that's really key. Um, actually talking to people, not feeling that they, they may be, th there's a lot that you hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, I think they think this of me. When you actually ask them, that's not the case at all. Um, so again, it's being brave enough to actually talk to say others and say, look, this is what I'm doing with my pony and this is why. And I think you, sometimes you can be surprised that people aren't judging you. Um, it's often in our heads sometimes as well as our lack of confidence. So it's, it's, but it is hard on a big yard, particularly. I think we've all felt that. Yeah, and taking that on how owners and the perception in a way, Penny, do you think that anthropomorphism is, is an issue here at all? I think, I think it, I've certainly seen it play a part uh, when we look at rugging, for example, um, seeing owners, um, you know, deciding whether to rug or not based on their own feelings um, and even what rug to buy based on what patterns on the outside. Um, it's probably one of the most common, you know, weight related human feeling things I see both as a welfare officer, but also as a regular horse owner. Um, and I think that whilst we know the reasonings as to why this happens, um, it's an area that if it's expanded, it, you know, it has the potential to have a, a very serious impact on, on welfare issues. So it's really important that it doesn't snowball. Um, you know, our, our equine systems have a, our equine internal systems have a very different way of working to us. And that is a message that I am starting to see being spread across the media. So that's a really positive start. But I think we're desperate to reach a wider audience with that message. And yeah, Helen, picking up a bit on that is because when we're trying to think about whether you rug, whether you turn out, whether you've got track systems or anything, do you feel that there is a problem when there's limitations on the facilities of a yard for you to be able to do that or to be able to have a horse with shelter and not have rugs or, or you know, what's your Definitely. views about this? Yeah, I mean, I've been on different yards over the years and now I've, I'm in a situation where I just have my horses on their own. I have a few acres, but I don't have facilities, so I don't have an arena to ride in. Um, the, the hacking's not bad during the summer months uh, because there's a network of byways, but this time of year we're on clay ground. You can't go on the byway, so you're limited to riding on the roads. Um, I can't put a tracking system in because we're on clay ground. Uh, in the summer, it's rock hard. In the winter, it's very wet. Um, the, the clay, in some ways, is a good thing because it means that the grass grows more quickly. But then, obviously, you're then worrying that the horses are going to have too much grass. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fine balancing act. Uh, the friend I mentioned earlier, she was saying she's on a very nice competition yard now where they're much more understanding of her situation with her horse. And, um, but it's got very nice poster rail paddocks and the owner there doesn't want her to subdivide her pony's paddock with electric fencing and plastic posts when she wants to make the area smaller for her horse to graze on. So there's always going to be some sort of compromise, hay soaking, some yards don't like that. And she was actually telling me that she left another yard because um, the owner didn't want her soaking hay there. So I, I think there are a lot of limitations that you know people will find quite difficult to implement some of the management techniques that could be used to help the horses lose weight. I think that's a good point for us to pick up. And, and just one point I wanted to pick up with you, Penny, just quickly before we go on to 
um, for final questions was a little bit we've been asked and you brought it up about the anthropomorphism and rugging and both Helen's talked about it but how the question we had is how do you inform the non-horsey and I presume that's the non-experienced horsey people that horses don't always need rugging and I think that was you you've both picked that up a little bit so to how do you go about that? Um, by talking to them basically um, explaining it and I don't think I've had one bad response from a non-horsey person when I've explained that. Um, what I have had is, is experience of explaining to a horsey person why the horse that's not wearing a hood doesn't need a hood. So the non-horsey people, I'm afraid, are, are easier to, to deal with than the horsey people because um, we're starting afresh with knowledge, I guess, with the non-horsey person. So I haven't found that to be a problem. Certainly communication is coming up and I'd be very intrigued with Tamsin at the end. But before we come to the end, we are getting to the last section of this. I could carry on listening to you and asking you questions, but I really would like all of you and I'll go through in no particular order. But um, I really think that you're here in a way, giving a perspective from the area you're involved in. And I'd really like you to ask how you feel your own sector can take responsibility and then so it's A, how your sector can, and then how your sector perhaps could work with other sectors and the industry as a whole to really help this whole area move forward. And if, if we could just start with uh, Liz, if I just start with you, uh, I have to be relatively quick, but if we could just start with you. Okay, thanks, Pat. I think um, for your first part, you know, how do we as sector take responsibility? I think we just have to continue to provide information about what feeds and forage contain, why they contain it. We want the owners to feel that they can engage with us um, and that they're getting support and advice. It's not just that, oh, they're just selling you a bag of feed. And I think that's where we have to keep promoting equine weight loss programs. We have to keep educating and helping owners link up the dietary management with the exercise and the management changes. Um, and very quickly, your second point regarding the different aspects, different parts of the industry, I think we need to continue to engage and work together so that if say a vet or a farrier or a trainer feels that horse they're working with is obese or is overweight, that they then encourage the owner to support, the, to go to the nutritionist, to go to the feed company I do feel we still have an element in some sectors that they see the feed industry as they're just to sell a bag of feed. And we're obviously in it for the health and the welfare of the horse. So I think it's engaging that we get all parties to pull together, as I think we've been talking about tonight. Thank you. And I think the gauging and, and, is, and communication seems to be coming through. And talking about that, David, just you're alongside Liz. What's your your take home and, and comments? Yeah, I mean, how, how can we work more responsibly? I mean, I think, um, as I said in the introduction piece, is, is really about making sure we can signpost people to the right places and being very proactive. We've, we've done quite a bit of work on this already. The welfare policy is going to develop this year. This is definitely going to figure within it, as are other things which are not here tonight. Um, and so taking responsibility about m making sure all our member bodies, for instance, through the showing council, because that's where a lot of these judges are coming from and, and, and the communication is coming from, and a lot of the competitors are members of those, um, making sure we start to engage in those conversations and give them the confidence to talk about it. Um, we already have and are building really good relationships as the showing council with other bodies. Um, we can never have enough and this has really helped and will help, I'm sure. So whatever comes out of this, we, we need to keep it going um, and establish some kind of link where we can keep the information flowing because information changes um, and we need to make sure we can, we can keep that um, going and put it in the right place and make it very accessible to anybody that wants it. So they're the two things for me. Thank you. And Penny, what about for you in both, you know, from the animal welfare sector per se, but then how do they engage and with the industry and each other? Uh, World Horse Welfare has been taking on the weight issue for, for some time and our right weight project was really well received and really highlighted the need to have more supportive tools. So the charity responded to that with a national roadshow 
working with individual yards and owners, um, trying to achieve the correct weight and giving them the tools to uh, maintain that long term. And the material continues to be available on our media channels and is often referenced when we're, we're looking at weight issues when they're raised. But I think that also the welfare sector as a whole, we really have to look at ourselves now and say that just telling somebody to do something is not good enough. It's, it's not going to work and we have to look outside the box. And just because that's the way perhaps things have been done in the past, we now need to move forward. And so um, for us, the human behaviour tools are, are key. Um, as the F1 industry as a whole, I would personally like to see the industry start by re-examining the imagery um, that they use on the media that's seen by all horse owners. I think it's so important that we show them what good looks like um, and not images of horses on the wrong side or horses that are rewarded in competition. So that's that's what I'd like to see going forward. Thank you. And, and Beth from Livery Yard, and also if you can touch a bit because you're also a coach and a trainer, um, and then into um, how working with the broader industry. Yeah, I think uh, the livery yard sector is hugely diverse from DIY yards right up to incredibly smart full livery yards. So it's quite a difficult sector to almost debate in one, one way. But I think for me, whatever yard you're on, it's about the yard owner or the manager being open to the differing needs of the owners. Um, and that from that, I mean, people that you know, have horses that may be overweight and they need help in some way to accommodate that particular horse and the owners or the managers being able to help the owner to do that. And also to understand that some owners may need additional support, education to help them to, to look after their horse. So again, it comes back to that open dialogue and communication, which I think is key, uh, whatever type of yard you're on. And the same with being a trainer or a coach um, and having that back to that trust and dialogue that if you're talking to someone about their horse, um, you feel that you can say things and that, that person will take it in a constructive way rather than maybe um, a challenging way. And that's not easy. And I think that comes down to building that trust. Um, so that's for me, I think, is what it's about. The second part um, is about, again, using the experts around us. And it's what everyone I think is saying tonight is about how we can work with each other. So using vets advice, nutritionist advice, working and listening to the owners as well, and trying to come at this in a cohesive way rather than a fragmented way. And I think for me, that's probably been the take home message about seeing it as working together for the good of the horse. Thank you, and working together, going along. Helen, how, how do you think from your area? Um, I echo Beth's sentiments entirely. And, you know, this cohesive approach and working together, I think is very important. I also come back to what Tamsin said earlier on and, um, you know, where people might understand, you know, that there is a problem in general, uh, but it's actually willingness to accept that they have a problem with their horse, um, much like, you know, you referred Tamsin to parents with children that are overweight and it's the same thing. Our horses are our children and, you know, nobody wants to admit that their horse is too fat looking at that picture of Jack, I put that in for a purpose because I look back at that picture, which is now nearly six years ago. And I think, gosh, yes, he was overweight. Um, but, you know, it, it, it takes looking back sometimes and looking at photographs to actually realize that. And I think people, you know, sometimes aren't quick enough to sort of acknowledge that they do have an issue. I think we can all use our social media um, in a positive way, um, not necessarily going on forums and advising other people, but we can use our own personal pages to direct people to educational tools such as this, to the World Horse Welfare tools and other charities tools, where there's um, very helpful advice on weight management. 
and to um, you know to nutritionist pages so people know where they can go for advice and I think we just all need to take responsibility. And, and Lucy, just for you? Yeah, I mean, from the veterinary sector's point of view, I just feel that I, I think we need to really take our role and our duty of care seriously and not walk away. You know, it's the easiest thing to do sometimes when faced with a, an overweight horse. I think we're in a really unique privileged position and we need to take that role responsibly and seriously and make it the norm for vets to talk about a horse's weight at every opportunity, routine vaccinations, when it's a lameness examination, doesn't matter. We need to start talking about it. And from the industry's point of view, I mean, the way that they can help us vets, I guess, would be the same things, really. Normalise the engagement, make assessing weight and tailoring management as a whole, so not just nutrition, but the whole picture, tailoring a horse's management to perfect it, to get the right weight and the perfect health for that animal is really important. I mean, none of us can do this single-handedly, not even the owners, and I think that's really important to, to understand that. It has to be done with a whole concerted team effort, and that is the only way we will get these horses away from suffering and away from potential death. Thank you, and before we ask Tamsin um, for some conclusions, Tamsin, I did want to ask you a question that has come up. And I'll read the question um, that a lot of the conversation tonight is focusing on educating and installing confidence in the horse owners who are, have overweight horses and encourage them to be brave and stand up to others who question or judge them. There is work to be done in educating the other side. So I suppose it's those who are judging. Mm -hmm. And do any of the panel have any thoughts of how we approach or tackle that? And I thought that was a very good question for you, Tamsin. Yeah, that's such a good question. Really good point, because often all of the education and so on is aimed, um, you know, at, at people with overweight horses. But it's absolutely true that, you know, and I've seen it just as much as anyone else, you know, if, if a horse has got a small hay net or whatever, then there can be a lot of bullying on yards and so on. Yeah, I think um, I think when in summing up, I was going to talk about kind of normalising all this stuff as well. So normalising um, horses being the right weight, rewarding healthiest body condition, normalising the fact that, you know, obesity is so common that it should be normal for all horse owners, especially if they have a native pony or cob. It should be absolutely automatic that you have a plan in place for thinking about weight management so a little like what Helen was saying about um, using our own social media for good not by telling other people what to do but you know making it normal that your body condition scoring your horse or you're thinking about its diet or whatever um, can really help in showing other people that that's actually a responsible action and it's not that you're you know enjoying starving your horse or you're just trying to be cruel because it's fun to put a grazing muzzle on or something but actually you're um, thinking uh, thinking about the horse's health overall um, so yeah I absolutely agree there's a lot of work to be done there but um, I think that that's something that all of the you know that vets can help with that horse owners can help with by sharing their responsible actions that livery yard managers absolutely can help with the welfare field um, and everyone working together really so yeah great question. Yeah and on another question that's come through and I think it's been picked up on this last discussion a bit is about the use of social media in that Helen it can be used for it can be used badly or it can be used for good and just quickly going around and I think there was a question from someone you know how, how do the speakers think we can constructively use it in a way that is not confusing and gives a consistent message so again just picking up Penny to start with and then we'll just go around on this because it's the communication seems particularly key. I, I think that uh, when it comes to social media we, you know people my interpretation of why people put those posts on there asking for people's opinion is because they let people lack confidence and if if that's the reason that they lack confidence and they want somewhere to go where they can get that reassurance then to me that's saying that there's a gap in the market of where can they go to get you know reliable scientific based information um and so I think, yeah, that's something that I would be looking at going forward to see if that's something that could help people. Um, I know Dr. David Marlin has, has launched his website and I've seen a lot of people having um, great success with knowing that they can go somewhere to get reliable information. Great. And, and Lucy, anything from you on that whole point? Because it's important vet practices and it was more about the consistency because we all have slightly different. So how do we manage to get 
as you said, there's not confusing advice or, or some of the panels this were saying. Yeah, I think, you know, we as a profession, us vets do need to try and sing a bit more from their same hymn sheets. And that's something that our veterinary association Beaver is trying to achieve. Um, and I think that's, that's exactly the point is signposting people to the reliable sources of information. And that's, you know, not as easy as it sounds because there is so much out there. And so trying to highlight the really good sources, hopefully the ones we've talked about today, like the, the equine welfare charities and the reliable feed manufacturers that have qualified nutritionists. Those are the places we should be going to ask for that sort of advice. And again, to, to vets, vets who are hopefully engaged on the topic and trying to learn as much as possible. So if we can just increase awareness and then also highlight the people that are really, really keen on this subject, really know their stuff and are qualified to talk about it. That's, I think, what's really important. Yeah, so thank you. And I, as I say, I think we could continue, but I know we have to draw and, and come to some conclusions. Tamsin, do you want to just, you know, spend a couple of minutes and just pick from what you've listened and heard today? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So um, my job here is, is really to kind of uh, pick up on the themes and um, that have been discussed and think about how we can apply human behaviour change principles to them and hopefully find some some ways or things that might help in the kind of longer term. So um, I've been listening carefully and scribbling lots of notes. And I mean, obviously, um, we've talked a huge amount about communication. And I think what's really interesting there is the kind of two sides. So we've got um, this idea that horse owners are sometimes um you know understandably don't want to hear that their um their horse as you know or their child as we described um is overweight so kind of changing that perception that um it's it's okay to ask it's okay to hear that the horse is overweight because they can act, you know that's something that can be changed and that's part of being a responsible owner is changing that and that's absolutely fine so um i would love to um to encourage horse owners or to perhaps we can you know talk about this campaign around encouraging owners to ask every professional that comes to them to kind of um, ask them what they think of their horse's weight you know get that idea of kind of working as a team working with professionals and then from the other side from all the the professionals to um to be communicating in that kind of really empowering and encouraging way rather than telling them that they've done something wrong and um, you know that um, you know that they're, they're not doing things right at the moment and so on so um, lots of what Penny spoke about about you know um, being motivational interviewing approaches being really encouraging and empowering in the way that we speak with people and the other thing that's come through really strongly is about creating environments for change so in human health with obesity we have um, lots of um, ways that we've structured the environment to um, improve things in relation to obesity. So things like um, the sugar taxes, for example, um, the fact that um, we address obesity earlier in schools um, and, um, and also activities that kind of normalize exercise and make it fun. Um, so Couch to 5K, park runs and so on. And um, we, in the horse world, we've got environments that make it difficult to change. So um, as we've, see, we've talked about, um, for example, the milder winters or just one kind of tiny thing, making it hard to change anthropomorphism, uh, social media and so on. But actually we are seeing initial changes with some of those things. So we are seeing more livery yards have grass-free turnout, for example. We're seeing more yards um, starting to have options such as track systems and Equicentral, which um, provide alternative ways of keeping horses um, who, who maybe aren't having as much ridden exercise. Um, we're seeing activities like, um, for example, your horse hack a thousand miles campaign to encourage people to ride out when it's safe to do so and for it to be fun to do that. Um, and of course, in the showing world, David Ingalls, you know, been a real kind of force for change in, in uh, you know, working with um, with the showing community to work out, you know, how we can how we can move forward there. And of course, there's still work to be done, as in as in all the industries. But you know, working together and providing this this platform as we have today, as I think Penny described as a as a catalyst, I think is really important. So um, we will be we will be collecting, of course, all the ideas. And, and so on that have come up today. But um, I think, Pat, we also wanted to encourage the audience, didn't we, to um, send in any ideas and thoughts and feedback that you have, because obviously this is an issue we know that affects um, a huge number of horse owners out there today. So I'm sure that you all have experiences and ideas and so on. Um, that will be absolutely relevant. And what we'll be doing is um, compiling the information and reports um, and, um, and ideas and so on to, to share back with everyone. So those are my initial thoughts. I'm happy to answer any more questions or anything. 
Thank you, Tamsin, and I look forward to that when we at the National Equine Forum. But just before we go, and I, I just come to conclusion, I just want to go around and just ask the panelists just for their final one sentence. Just so any thoughts you have, any other thing else you'd like to add to the debate in just a final, final sentence. And I, I'm going to start the other way around. So Lucy, I'm going to just start with you. So your final concluding one sentence. I would just really like to see owners um, see this as a, an exciting challenge, see it as a positive thing that they can do for their horses. If, they, if their horse is now alive, then they can do something about getting its weight right, um, you know, and prevent it having health issues in the future. So really relish in the ability that you've got to do something really good for your horse. Thank you. And Helen? Uh, I think I would just sum up by the last sentence that I used in my presentation was that you know your horse best, but don't be afraid to seek professional advice and everybody such as vets, nutritionists, livery yard owners, they're there to help you and your horse. Thank you. And Beth? Um, for me, I think it's about being open to new ideas, um, keeping up to date with credible information and again, keeping that open dialogue and discussion. Thank you. And Penny? Uh, I would say seek advice from those that are trusted and reliable sources. David? Yes, yeah, very similar to Penny, really. I think um, challenge yourself to build really good quality relationships with other professionals, uh, whatever that might be, you know, feed, exercise, keep health, well-being, all those things. But invest in those relationships. Don't just suddenly think, oh, I need to speak to so-and-so. Great, you might need to do that. But actually invest in the quality of that relationship. So it's a building relationship. And then you build trust and you build your portfolio of knowledge. So um, it's not just a one-off. It's, you know, a horse isn't just for today. It's for tomorrow and the rest of your life. So it's put, put some effort into it. Thank you. And Liz? I think it's all about, I think as most of us said, communication and engagement. I think it's important that owners don't feel they're out there alone. They're not the only one struggling with the fat pony. There's plenty of like-minded people. And if they can encourage dialogue together, we can all get through it together. That's working with other owners and working with professionals. We're all here to help because at the end of the day, we just all love our horses. Thanks. And again, to say on the NEF website, there are resources to signpost to for people to get advice and help. It's a start of the journey um, and I'm looking forward like Tamsin that we will be reporting back at the National Equine Forum in March. But I think in conclusion, uh, we would all agree that this has been a fascinating overview of the challenges faced by those of us trying to manage the weight of horses, ponies and donkeys. And in addition, I think perhaps more importantly, it started to give us some real insights in how we may all work together, which is very much the seems to be the overriding of working together to provide these practically applicable constructive solutions. So I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists, but also all of those working behind the scenes and setting this up, keeping the chat going, keeping monitoring the Q&A. And I think I would just like to like thank everybody for their input into this fascinating discussion. And as I said before, this is only the starting point. And as Tamsin said, please help us, all of you that are on this, deba on this debate tonight, or those of you that pick it up afterwards, help us to move the debate along, but let, by letting us know what you think are the most important areas, any areas you think we didn't cover, any experiences that you've had, and what you consider may be the biggest blockers that people experience in managing the weight of their horses, ponies and donkeys. So thank you to all of you who've attended and to everybody involved. And I'll pass it back to Tim. And uh, sorry, I should also say thank you very much in general to the National Equine Forum and all of the sponsors of tonight's event. Thank you very, thank you very much, Pat. And can I thank on behalf of the National Equine Forum, all of you for attending. I think it's been a really interesting uh, and thoroughly enjoyable uh, webinar and it's really started the debate and it's really a case of how we take it forward. But none of this could really operate without the thanks of our sponsors. So again, I'm really grateful to the British Horse Society, Red Wings, uh, Spillers, Talk Equine and World Horse Welfare for their support. 
Um, as Pat has said, um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and I think you will agree we've had an excellent uh, panel of speakers. Uh, just a couple of things before going through the rest of this slide. Um, really, the success of these sort of meetings depends very much on the chairmanship. And Pat's been an excellent chairman. So thank you very much, Pat. That's been really, really good. And then behind the scenes, um, Pat's thanked the, the team running this webinar. And it really does need three or four people running this. But we should all be thankful that we have an administrator, Georgina Crossman, someone who really makes it all happen. So thanks very much, George. Here you can see the slide. If there are things you want to do, you can, you can look uh, at uh, the link to the webinar, which will go out in the next 48 hours via Eventbrite. Um, the feedback form, we like to know what you think. So please, if you've got views, thoughts, can you use um, that link? Uh, and within the email and, and send us things you think we haven't covered, what you would like in future sessions. And then finally, just to remind you, the 29th National Equine Forum is scheduled for 10 o'clock, Thursday, the 4th of March. Tickets are available uh, in early February from the website, uh, but please look out. We've got a really good program. Uh, it's gonna be different uh, clearly this year, but hopefully it will be as, as useful and as thought provoking as ever. So thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And again, many thanks to the sponsors. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.